Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, many thanks for joining us on the Journal of Biophilic Design. We're really happy to be joined again by Dr. Patty Baker. Um, she's an archaeologist and academic. We had a fantastic interview and it was on the tw- uh, July the 26th in 2021. So if you're listening to this on uh, Amazon and Spotify and YouTube, you can search for it on, on those platforms as well as on our website, the Journal of Biophilic Design.com. Um, and uh, yeah, so today we're going to talk about viewing health, the Esclepia and their natural surroundings. And if you're listening, you're probably going, Asclepia, what's that? Well, we're going to tell you all about it. Well, I'm not going to tell you all about it. Patty is. Patty, many thanks for joining us today. Thank you again for having me, Nessa. I really enjoyed the first um, talk, so I'm looking forward to this today. So thanks again for asking me to come back. (laughs) Wonderful, lovely. Well, um, as a reminder for the people who are listening to you um, first off today, um, can you tell us about what you do and what your speciality is, please? Okay, basically um, my uh, academic research uh, started out in ancient medicine and I uh, started out looking at medical care in the Roman army on the Rhine and Danube and British frontiers. And for my PhD and just looked at differences in medical practices within the army. And, um, and then from there, I started seeing lots of links with the environment and landscape and health and, and then sensory studies and how that played into health. And it's just taken off. It's, it's been wonderful because this study of ancient medicine has led me down so many different paths of ancient gardening. I'm looking at flower arranging and flower crowns and, and they even have um, relationships to health in the body. So, so that's my um, general research area. So I look at both the archeology span and the text. So it's, it's a mix of different things. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and in our first podcast, we, um, we, kind of, we, we discussed the fact that biophilia and biophilic design um, obviously by its very name, obviously, <laughs> is, yeah. is ancient, is Greek, um, but um, we did discuss um, views and nature and how Roman gardens incorporated, particularly Roman gardens in Pompeii, incorporated biophilic design in their spaces for health and, uh, and well-being um, and, and all the different rationale behind the words and, and the terminology that, um, that the Romans used uh, in order to create and and to understand um, the humours and and the different sort of health benefits of uh, biophilic design. But today, so as I mentioned at the beginning, you're going to be talking about Esclipia um, and you sent me your brilliant paper, Viewing Health, Esclipia and the Natural Surroundings uh, from Religion in the Roman Empire. Please tell me what drew you to the topic. What drew it to me was when actually when I was doing my PhD research, so I, had nothing, I wasn't looking at landscape, I was just looking at medical tools that were, were found in Roman forts, but I had to go visit museums on the Rhine, Danube, um, and around Britain, so I was in Germany and Switzerland and Hungary, Austria, Netherlands, as well as um, all around the UK. And uh, so many sites, because I would visit the Roman forts and I kept seeing there were beautiful views. Now, of course, this is a modern perspective. They may have had, you know, they were forested now, but then I had to question whether or not they were forested then, uh, but most, it seems like they were in many places, but they were always had these just fantastic views. And then I started joking around with friends that the the Romans didn't build forts for um, security or anything like that. It was just for the views. (laughs) So if you go out to Hadrian's Wall and you're in the center at Halsteads and you just have these views across Northumberland, it's, it's fabulous. I mean, it's cold and freezing and we know the soldiers weren't always happy being there, but it just kept thinking, gosh, everything's so nice. And so that's, it was just more of a joke than anything else. And then I went to Chedworth Roman Villa at around the same time I was doing my research and looked up and there was this view up into the hills. And I thought, geez, there it is again, the views. <laughs> so it started off as a bit of a joke. And then um, as I was doing uh, research, I started looking at objects called collyrium stamps that looked at medicine and eye medicines basically. And I just started thinking more about views and I had been to Greece when I was an undergraduate and, and went to, um, uh, Epidaros, which is we'll talk about later. And again, it is just beautiful. And, and then these views. And I started wondering what, um, you know, just, well, what did people going to these healing sanctuaries see? So it was sort of a question of that. 
And actually one of the archeologists who wrote about Epidaurus actually talks about the views. He says, when I come down into the valley, you know, there's these stunning views. So even he noticed this. And uh, so it just began, I just started to question, uh, is there something about the views that might actually contribute to their sense of well-being or, or the healing of the play, the healing powers of the place? So that's how it all started. But, yeah, so. All right. Um, I mean, sort of vision and landscape help restore the body and mind, and they believed that. Um, and obviously the healing sanctuaries um, that were dedicated to Asclepius, um, can you sort of tell us who Asclepius was and um, and also what forms the sanctuaries took? So, so listeners, we are going to describe what Asclepia are now. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'll tell you who Asclepius was, and then we'll talk about the places where he's worshipped. But Asclepius was a Greek god, and then the Romans adopted him, and his name's become, a, a, well, it's pretty similar, Asclepius, it's the same thing, really. Um, but he he was born he was the son of the god apollo and apollo as most of you probably know but if you don't he was the god of the sun uh, music the arts and he was also a healing deity as well apollo has healing powers um apollo is also very unlucky in love and he has lots of affairs with women who either don't like him or you know have adulterous affairs while he's with them and he was um he was having uh, an affair with a woman named Coronis, which is uh, sadly a bit easy to remember because it's like Corona today. <laughs> um, but uh, so he, he um, falls in love with Coronis and um, she becomes pregnant, but doesn't tell him. And she apparently has a, uh, an affair with a Greek, a mortal Greek named Ischius. And Apollo finds out, uh, sorry, Asclepius finds out that she's having this. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's Apollo who finds out that um, Corona is having this affair. And there are several different versions of the story. Um, and anyway, he finds out uh, he, he either kills him, her himself or he has his sister Artemis kill her. You know, anyway, as she's on the funeral pyre, she screams out that she's pregnant and he rescues the infant, not her. And the <laughs> infant is Asclepius, the, um, his, his child. And then Asclepius, will become the god of healing. Um, and he gives Asclepius to Chiron. Chiron's a centaur, so one of these mystical beasts that's half man, half horse. And Chiron also is a healer and Chiron teaches Asclepius the art of healing. And then eventually uh, throughout, Greek, um, throughout Greek and Roman history, he becomes the god, Asclepius becomes the main god of healing, but you can still worship Apollo, Chiron, and other deities as well, but he's the main healing deity. And he also has a, a, a daughter named Hygieia, where we get the word hygiene from. So sometimes when you see images of Hygieia or his daughters with him, so you've got Asclepius and Hygieia, and there are a lot of other minor deities that sort of have relations to him or not. And even ancient Greek doctors, will say they're uh, trace their lineage back to Asclepius. So he's a very important deity uh, um, in healthcare in the ancient world. Uh, well, was hit or miss. <laughs> Sometimes it worked very well, but you know, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have, um, you know, they didn't even have things to put you to sleep, uh, you know, when you're going through surgery. So you want to stay healthy. So worshiping a deity and keeping the God of health happy is important. So you find little shrines to Asclepius all throughout the ancient world, Greek and Roman, but there are special sanctuaries, which are the Asclepia, um, where people who generally, as far as we can tell, who had mainly had chronic conditions, so long-term conditions, and who could travel a little bit, would go to these healing sanctuaries um, dedicated to the god Asclepius. And there's several large ones. So there's one on the island of Kos, mm -hmm. where the Greek writer, um, he, uh, medical writer Hippocrates um, was supposed to have lived. So there's a healing sanctuary there. There's one in Pergamum in Turkey. Um, there's one on the island of the Tiber in Rome. There was, uh, so the Romans uh, have Asclepia as well. And then there, um, the main one is Epidaurus. There's also smaller ones in Athens and Corinth. So they're everywhere, but they, they have these really big center. Mm -hmm. And the main one is at Epidaurus because this is supposedly one of the birthplaces of, of the goddess Glapius. Mm -hmm. So what you would see it generally, um, you will talk about the rituals of what you do there later, but generally what you find in them is a temple to the god and usually the altar is outside so the greeks and romans would worship 
outside. You would place things on the um, temple outside. For the most part, the altar would be outside. So there's an altar. Then you get lots of other little buildings. Um, sometimes you find Roman baths. So the Romans add to these buildings. So the Epidaurus was basically, you start seeing a lot of work in the buildings around the late fifth, into the fourth century BC. Um, it's evident that people were worshiping there earlier, but the, the actual buildings go up mainly around the fourth century. Um, and what else is there? Are there? There seems to be dining rooms. So people would go and stay here. So there are places, uh, possible buildings uh, where people slept, um, just like a little hotel, <laughs> if you want. <wanted. laughs> and little shrines. And then there are lots of inscriptions that uh, people would leave or, um, or the priest would record of different heal healing miracles mm -hmm. that the God performed. And um, then also there's, there were games to the goddess Glapius. So you have also Stadia. And then there's a famous theater um, at Epidaurus, which um, is just outside the site, which was possibly done in honor of the goddess Glapius and Apollo as well, because Apollo is a theater deity. But they're beautiful sites. Um, generally, um, they're places where people could access quite easily. I mean, sometimes you have to climb a few steps, but for the most part, um, the views around, they're usually surrounded by mountains or seas. So again, they're beautiful views. Uh, they're, they're, you know, if you've ever been to yeah. Epidaurus, which I think you mentioned you had. So. Yeah, and Pergamon as well. I've been to Pergamon. That's absolutely stunning. Yeah, wow. just, the, yeah, I think um, some, something for me, which I really picked up on, which I know you're going to talk about, um, but um, is the sort of the nature, the water, the fresh air, that kind of and the views of mountains and hills and and I, I remember feeling completely refreshed having yeah. visited there and and it was there was something really special about it I mean people talk about energies and all this kind of stuff and if you're into that then you know maybe there is some there are some energies there but um it was the, it was the views and the space and the quietness and the location of it was it really was something else and yeah. um yeah really really was yeah, and I think that's one thing when I was, I haven't been, I've only been to Epidaurus and the one in Athens and Corinth, but I haven't, unfortunately, haven't been to Pergamum yet, um, but someday. <laughs> but, um, and, and I haven't been to the one on Kos either, but you are right, there is just, it's a beautiful space, very peaceful. Thank and you. well, there are some Asclepia in cities, but they tend to be, they, they're sort of closer to the outskirts. And there could be a couple different reasons why they would place those there. Mm -hmm. First, if people are sick, you don't want them too close to the center of the city. And second, um, it does, it probably would have been a quieter space. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you want to put these in maybe quieter spaces. And then as you, the one in Epidaurus was, there's a town of Epid, an ancient town of Epidaurus, but this, the sanctuary itself is outside. Mm -hmm. So again, it probably would have been very quiet, you know, and, and again, they wouldn't have airplanes, electric vehicle, you know, vehicles, electricity, all that. We have some noise pollution. They wouldn't have had that. So you can just imagine the, mm -hmm. the quiet at the time. And, and you're right, there's the views. You do feel very refreshed when you go to these sanctuaries, it's yeah. even <laughs> so. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, people can go and experience these places. So, you know, everything to Epidaurus and Corinth, Cos, Pergamon. Um, obviously, they have, you know, beautiful views of nature. Um, I mean, why, why were they important? I mean, did, I mean, obviously, did many Greeks, I mean, obviously, Romans as well, attended later. But, um, you know, what, what do we think happened there? Could you maybe explain, you know, what, the, what, what happened there, really? But basically why they're important, I mean, just, just to clarify, there are uh, different types of sanctuaries for different deities throughout the Greco-Roman world, so we're just focusing on the healing ones. But um, why they're important is, I mean, they, they did have doctors in the ancient world, some very skilled doctors, some very skilled surgeons. But as I said previously, you know, they didn't have all the modern advantages we have. Um, so sometimes people just had chronic conditions that would, you know, they just couldn't heal. So in the end, they would go to, they would put their trust in a God. Sometimes they would probably put their gut trust in the deities first before a doctor. As I said, treatment could be painful. Yeah. So they're important for that because, you know, we're talking about a world where illness is much more common. People die, you know, people did live a long time. I mean, some people were extremely healthy and they do a lot to maintain their health. But when you do get sick, um, um, you would just have to put your faith in the, 
doctors or into deity. And it's interesting at these sanctuaries, you often find little votive offerings of body parts. Yeah. So that, yeah, a lot of archeologists try to interpret, well, what kind of illnesses could they have been? And just to give you common ones are eyes. Mm-hmm. So we know that people, as you get older, <laughs> glasses. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, but if you're born with vision problems or something like that, they didn't have glasses or, you know, you'd, you'd have to be outside. So, um, so again, there's, there's obviously a lot to do with vision problems that, and also eye diseases are common, you know, things like conjunctivitis that it spreads so quickly that could be another common problem, which is very easy to resolve today. But again, in the past, if that, um, there is, uh, if that continued, it becomes a chronic illness. So you get a lot of eye problems, you get a lot of ears and the ears um, possibly represent healing, uh, hearing difficulties, or also some have actually found th- uh, words of thanks to the gods, like, thank you for listening to me. So it's like, would you listen to me? I have a problem. <laughs> uh, you get male and female genitalia. So there's probably reproductive problems or maybe urinary tract problems or uh, things like that. And um, then there's uh, these little, what are argued to be uteri or wombs, uh, but some people are now beginning to question whether or not that's what these objects are, um, but you get a lot of what have been interpreted as wombs. So again, um, fertility issues seem to come up. And, oh, legs and hands, so yeah. feet and hand problems as well. <laughs> Generally, every part of the body, but you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember seeing those. I, I worked at the British Museum for a while in the, in the Greek and Roman department, and I remember, yeah, they had sort of different collections. I remember sort of holding them, you know, and it's now they're pretty, 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 um, curious when you see them but when you think about it actually you know to try and direct your attention and and in their belief their the god's attention to your leg or your 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 ears or your eyes or whatever it is you know you're saying that these are little flat often bronze aren't they sort of bronze um uh kind of outlines sort of cutouts if you want aren't they really um sort of stamped yeah Mm -hmm. and then inside yeah yeah it's bronze um sometimes and bronze and terracotta figurines common but actually since you mentioned the bronze ones it's just like you still see this in orthodox you know, greek and russian orthodox churches today mm-hmm. you still, um if you go to one of these churches you'll see at the front by the altar lots of these little tin hanging things of representing body parts so yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant and i know they used to go there and um, and sleep didn't they that was kind of one of the things they did yeah so so anyway so um Yes, yeah, so to go now, the actual rituals that occurred, yeah. um, we have some information from a writer named Elias Astyides who talks about sleeping. And then Aristophanes, who wrote um, a comedy called Wealth or Plutus, mm-hmm. also gives a description of a little bit of a description of what you have to do. And actually, Aristophanes is pretty thorough. He just says, that you go to the sanctuary, you purify yourself. So before you go in, you ritually bathe or wash your hands or something. Then um, you have to leave an offering to the God. So he talks about leaving cakes. And then what's interesting, he says they, that they slept in the temple. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of theories about where people actually slept, but uh, whether it's in a separate space called an abaton, uh, which is, just means sacred space, actually. So it could be in the temple, it could be somewhere else. It's it's yeah. you know, it's up for interpretation. But anyway, according to Aristophanes, he sleeps in the temple, and um, he hears people snoring, and there are other sick people around him. <laughs> and then he talks about priests stealing things off the altar. But <laughs> you know, so it's a comedy. But interestingly enough Elias Aristides also mentions you know similar practices you you sleep in sacred spaces or and he was a second century Roman period writer he wrote in Greek and he went to Pergamum for quite a few years Mm -hmm. and he wrote uh, a collection well the collection of work is called the sacred writings or and it's his uh, he's recording basically his dreams because the way Asclepius would heal was you would sleep and then Asclepius would come to you and heal you in your sleep and you'd either see the deity himself or he would repre- um, come as a snake and perhaps or a dog so they're the two animals associated with Asclepius so you would dream about either the god a snake or a dog and the snake dog or the god would you know heal or lick or 
um, do so, you know, touch the part that was that needed um, healing, and then apparently you would wake up cured. So, uh, Elias Aristides tells us a lot about different dreams. I have a friend who's actually works on him much more closely. Uh, her name's Georgia Petridou, and she's at um, Liverpool. But that's her work is is really looking very closely at at what um, Aristides wrote about, and then. Um, yeah, but then we also have inscriptions at the sanctuary, especially at Epidaurus, where they um, tell us some of the crazy, I would have to say crazy dreams people had because there are <laughs> ones where, you know, people go in and I think there's one story where a guy has a, a problem with his jaw. There's a, a bit of an arrowhead in his jaw, if I can remember correctly. And he wakes up and of course the arrowhead's in his hand and the God comes. And it's another one where they cut off the head of the patient. You know, the God comes off, takes the head off, removes the illness puts the head back on the person wakes up cured so they're a little fantastic you know fantastic yeah. dreams and whether or not people really dreamt these or they're just stories that the you know people uh, the priests wrote to attract visitors like like marketing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that advertising yeah. on the wall <laughs> Come good it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. the idea was you were healed in your sleep and there's a lot of images of um from different asclepia where you see asclepius usually his daughter Hygia and then there's a patient lying down sleeping and Asclepius has his hands over the patient mm -hmm. and uh, so there are a few images of that so we also have images that show us that this is how he would come and, and heal the person so you'd sleep you'd spend time in the sanctuary um, and then supposedly leave after you felt cured but interestingly enough a lot of ancient doctors also worked around the sanctuaries or in them so you could get practical healing as well as um religious healing <laughs> so. so really it was like a sort of biophilic hospital <laughs> <laughs> and you know people could go there it's very quiet they, you know aristides does mention that it's quiet and peaceful and um so yeah and it's it's a place that people could probably just rest and even yeah sleep, yeah. sleep. so yeah, really yeah so creating somewhere that's acoustically lovely um mm -hmm. and visually beautiful um yeah. obviously lots of natural you know, light and smells and air and and yeah. if people are listening, if they listen to the previous podcast that we did, and you'd really do go into like, um, I mean, it's really fascinating that how they interpreted clean air, fresh air as 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 good air and healing yeah. air that went inside us and 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 um, was good for us yeah. and, and for our well being. Um, yeah. So in in these Asclepia, you have this, you have all these elements which you know ironically we are doing now we're trying to get you know biophilic design into healthcare to try and make us but actually that was they kind of recognized the fact that if you could create a space all those years ago if you can create a space that had beautiful views that was quiet that was surrounded by nature um there was birds obviously must use, there is bird song there's lots of water isn't there some of these places you know um as well um and views of the of the of the sky and um you know through the colonnades and things as well but you know you mentioned that in your paper um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's lovely. Oh, you mentioned as well about the Roman writer Vitruvius mm -hmm. and his book on architecture. And yes. when he's commenting on the construction of colonnades, that's right. You say that, you know, it would be great um, if there was a colonnades were open to the sky so you could see through them. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you could sort of talk about that. Um, yeah, sure. but... OK, I'll, I'll even read out the section for you. But just to yeah. remind people, Vitruvius is a late first century BC, early first century AD Roman writer. And he writes a whole treatise on how uh, architecture, basically how to deal different things. But what's very interesting of time and time again, the health aspects come into how you build structures, you know, uh, how, how to keep people warm in the winter, cool in the summer, get the fresh air going through. It's always about fresh air as we mentioned in the previous one, but views are also important. So I'll read um, what he says and then I'll explain what he means by it. So this comes from book five, section five, so on his architecture. And he's talking about building colonnades around, um, it's near a theater, but he says that um, the central space between the porticos, so the porticos of the colonnade, should be ornamented with greenery in as much as walks in the green and fresh air are very healthy. First, in respect of the eyes, because the air from green plants being light and volatile insinuates itself into the body when in motion, clears the sight, removes gross humors from the eyes, leaves the vision clear and distinct, 
Moreover, when the body is heated by the exercise of walking, the air extracting its humors diminishes corpulency, dissipating what is superabundant in the body. That is, the case, that is the case, may be proved by observing that from fountains and covered places, or those which are under or moist uh, or under, no moist vapors rise, whilst in open places exposed to the air when the rising sun darts its rays upon the earth, he raises the vapors from humid and marshy places and gathering them into masses carries them into the air. If therefore in open places, the noxious humors of bodies are carried off by the air. So again, what he's saying is, first of all, he's talking about, you know, it's always clean air. You want your fresh, clean air. You don't want it noxious or smelly. Um, but what he means is also the vision. And this is what I'll focus on now is the vision is really important. It's, I think I explained in the last time I spoke to you, but I'll explain it again. The way they understood vision is to work is two ways, the sense of vision. Either your eyes, this is Plato's idea, is your eyes shoot out something, mixes with the sun and pulls in whatever you're seeing. And that goes into, not only into your um, eyes and then your brain so you understand it, it actually is going into your body. So you have, you know, the plants I can see behind you. If you look at those, not only do you understand that they're plants, but the color green goes into your eyes, the plant goes into your body. And he believes that this actually goes into you. And then the other one is the atomic view or the atomist view is that the, the plants that you may be looking at will be letting off little atoms that come straight to your eyes. They fit into your eyes, go to your brain, you understand what it is, but it's also then affecting your humoral balance. So you have humors in your eyes. Humors are yellow bile, black bile, phlegm and blood. And you know, if you, if, you, if you have too much of one humor, it could cloud up your vision. So this is what he's saying. So look at something green. And this will actually um, clarify your vision. So your vision will become clearer, less foggy. So they, they recommend this. Um, so this is what he's talking about. It's really good it's just to look at green or even blue things will, will be important. But greenery is really good for clearing vision. Mm -hmm. And um, just another along that line, as it's Pliny the Elder who talks about people who work, um, who make very fine gemstones. He says they're looking at very fine details. Remember, they don't have glasses. Yeah. He says, so to clarify the vision, he says after working, they have to look at something green and he recommends emeralds. He says, oh. just stare at an emerald for a while and this will clear your vision. So there's really something about green, but it's Vitruvius who gives us a better explanation that it's going into you and it's taking away the nasty humors and clearing you. And then the second part of that is also walking around because by walking you're the humors are moving around in your body and you can expel them and you know, he says corpulent humors so if you're a little heavy you know by exercising basically as we would know it exercising you know you lose some weight but he's saying you'll, you'll get rid of some of those this thicker humors you don't want in the body so that that's the whole point of of looking at something nice and green it, it does go into you it actually goes into you mm. walking and exercising you know what you're taking in will help move humors around so it's it's all about this connection between inside and outside the body and it's done through your sensory experiences so, yeah. that's it's really interesting it's, it's fascinating that they just you know they realized or they, they had an understanding that green that green was a thing the green yeah. that was like a key to healing was agreeing to improving our our, 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 our psychology as well as our well-being and our, our mental state as well as our health um yeah. physical health i mean it was very much physical health wasn't it that you know you look at you're looking like you're saying the views you're looking at the green and it's actually entering into you which will heal you i mean yeah. I, I mean i just it'd be, i mean i had how did they work that out i mean where did that come from i mean you know was that I mean, it seems like there's a whole bunch of writers, a whole bunch of, um, you know, ancient writers we're talking about here. So we're sort of like, what, what sort of period are we talking about when, when all this sort of like roughly starts, you know? Um, yeah, I think we start seeing this, you start seeing, I'll, uh, with the Hippocratic writers, so around the yeah. 5th century BC is when we start getting literature about it. Yeah. Um, but how early, you know, what they're, if they're taking this from much earlier on, I have, you know, we just don't know. Um, yeah. we can guess just by, as I said, like looking at the landscapes people lived yeah. in or something, but, um, and then, but we just see it become more, um, uh, you see more discussion of it in the later Greek and early Roman period and just seems to develop from there. So yeah. you, 
get more um, thoughts. But there is actually a Hippocratic. We always talk about the uh, the Doctor Hippocrates, but there's a bunch of work called the Hippocratic Writings. Were written by many different people, uh, but they're, they're all classified as Hippocrates. But remember, there are many different people. But one of the works is um, called Affections, and again, I found that. And let me find it here. Uh, yeah, Affections. He just says. So this is about late fifth, maybe fourth century BC when this work was written. Yeah. And he, he's talking about bodily humors again. And, um, but he says that, um, let's see here. Now a person with Beth able to understand such things. So ultimately you could affect the body humors. And he says from smell, sound, sight, venery and heat and cold. So again, he's recognizing that your humors are affected by your sensory experiences, as well as, you know, the, the heat and cold, which can also be touch and, you know, because you, you feel heat and cold on your body. And so, yeah. And of course, you mentioned Hippocrates, the original Hippocrates, not all the other ones yeah. as well. Um, it's a bit like the Homer question, isn't it? But we won't, we'll yeah. leave that. We'll park that. We just will park that for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but he was on Cos, wasn't he? Which is where one of these Asclepia were. So, and as you say, there were doctors around the area and stuff as well, which is, and obviously, we, our modern doctors, obviously, people probably understand that, you know, we, we use the Hippocratic oath. Mm -hmm. so um so that's just where that connection is for people who are listening um but I, I just I do find it really interesting I mean I do I mean I, I you know that we've, we've there's a disc it's a disconnect between this sort of ancient knowledge this ancient history this ancient um understand you know of of, of nature and and the benefit for you know to us and, and now you know yeah. like you know I'm, I'm I'm really hoping that people are listening going oh my goodness I want to know more about this and, and go yeah. off and and, and see, go study some some Latin and Greek texts. <laughs> I'll just, just find out more about it, and you know, go to your website as well. You know, so um, which I'll put links again. People listening, I'll, I'll put links to uh, Patty's websites and stuff, so you can just ask her questions, ask her loads of stuff, <laughs> um, and find out more. Um, I'll put that on the website of the Journal of Biophilic Design .com and also on all the um, on the editorial blurbs for the podcast and also on YouTube. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, can you quote maybe some other sort of Greco-Roman um, medical writers uh, on how views of nature are good for us? I mean, I, I mean, the paper that you've got. I mean, I know you're just such a font of knowledge, and I, I don't, you know, I can, I can sort of keep you here for another hour at least, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but yeah, if there's anything you want to highlight, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's interesting. You just sort of get lots of different weird references throughout, and it's usually like one or two sentences where yeah. they say. Um, uh, another Hippocratic writer, I forget in which work, also mentions the senses, you know, yeah. you, it's just healing through the senses. Um, and there's every, every Greco-Roman medical writer will mention the surrounding landscape. I mean, it's just, you have to consider, it's holistic. The medicine is holistic. It's not just about the inside of the body. It's your surrounding area, what's good for you, what's bad for you. So you get this, um, it's ubiquitous, yeah. but for actual sight, it's it's what's really interesting. It's just odd little statements here and there, um, but it's obviously something important because, as I said, we have the archaeological evidence. You know where you're, where thing where these structures and sites are situated. You have the artifacts, as I mentioned, but it even carries on into the um, Islam uh, medieval Islamic period. There's a Roman. Um, uh, medical writer Galen and some of his work only survives today because somebody in the medieval Islamic world translated it into Arabic and I don't read Arabic so but I you know but there I'm is learning it. I'm learning it <laughs> oh, good for you. well there's a lot of work you can translate <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> but um I'll just but there is one really interesting I came across it it's about a man named Ibn al-Ghazar, uh, who wrote a work on lovesickness in a book called Sustenance for the, of the Traveler. So I'm not, it's probably about 9th century AD. And in it, he's quoting Galen, a work called The Faculties of the Soul from Follow Mixtures of the Body. So it's a work that we don't really have much information about. But in it, he says, the therapy should be consistent in entertaining people lest they suffer from melancholy, which is you know, um, sadness. They should drink wine while listening to music, talk to friends, recite poetry, look at water gardens, ingredient, and, and 
look at water, gardens, greenery, and radiant faces. So again, he's saying that these are nice things that will affect, you know, if you have melancholy at least, which is in the ancient world and in the Arabic world, melancholy is you have too much black bile. It makes you sad, down, depressed. So um, to get rid of melancholy, you know, again, it's the good environment. And we still talk about this today. If you feel down, and I know you mentioned it in your journal that you get outside, be in nature, look at the trees. This is what they're still talking about this, uh, or they were talking about this then. And it goes into the Arabic world as well. And from what little I know, I did do one little paper looking at some of the surviving hospitals from the Arab, medieval Arabic period in Spain and elsewhere. But again, the same idea principles come through. It's quiet. Um, it's mainly quiet, but you know, fresh air, nice. If you, even though these are enclosed buildings, they have gardens in the middle of them, some of them and courtyards. So the, with the water and the, you mm -hmm. know, the, the greenery. So these same ideas are coming through then. And, and he just says that's, you know, gardens, water, everything, greenery, you know, gardens for greenery, water. And we see, you know, some of the Asclepia have views out to the sea and over the sea, Kos and Pergamum and yeah. So you see water, you see the mountains, you see the greenery. I also like that he says, um, yeah, water gardens, greenery and radiant faces. So you want people <laughs> happy. <laughs> <laughs> you want smiley faces around you. <laughs> it's really exactly. cool. yeah, yeah, I did. I liked as well. You know, you, you know, she drink wine while listening to music. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah. This is this is this is this is all my new my new mantra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I repeat it so everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. Um, I was going to say as well. Um, did you have a favorite um, Esclepian at all? Um, I, I'd like to see more, which is, I think, uh, but at the Mont Epidaurus, that was the, the first one. As I said, Corinth is beautiful as well, but it's a, it's a smaller city, Asclepian. Um, the one in Athens, it's, it's not, you know, it's, if you just, if you're in Athens, it's right there, just yeah. beneath the Acropolis. Um, but yes, yeah, uh, Epidaurus, it's just stunning. I mean, it's, it's, and I do remember the, just going there, this sense of peace. Although you feel this at other sanctuaries, I remember it particularly at Epidaurus, and it was just, and I, I still remember the scent of cypress and pine that was really strong. And again, if we, I'm sure it was there in the ancient world, but we'd have to check, you know, do a lot of um, sampling to see what kind of pollen's in the air, but I'm sure it did have some pleasant scents um, from just the, the surrounding mountains. And, but the views, it is, it's an extremely beautiful and calming space. So I always like that. Yeah. 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 It is, it's, it's a beautiful, um, I actually remember going there and uh, I was, I was, um, there were some other people I was with and, and one of the girls was a, was a singer and she sang at the, she, it was amazing in the, in the uh, amphitheater and, you know, the whole um, acoustics there was just brilliant, but the views, oh my goodness, are absolutely, as you say, um, breathtaking and um yeah. yeah i think i think we can learn a lot so um people who are who are designing spaces and designing hospitals and designing healthcare facilities if you get a chance to go on holiday when we can actually get on the plane and own safe and we're we're going to come back in one piece <laughs> um, <laughs> um and not spend a fortune as well on all the all the all the injections that we need to have um and yeah. test and stuff um but yeah we, for them people to go to epidaurus and to go and have a look at these sites to be inspired and to kind of go you know hey this was happening in you know two and a half thousand years ago i mean yeah. yes it's two and a half more than that now over two and a half thousand years ago they, mm -hmm. they created these beautiful spaces of harmony and for well-being and for healing but actually with a with the, the concept of healing because they realized and they understood that views of nature views of greenery is good for us um uh yeah i don't know i think i said to you before i've got sort of personal beer in my bonnet personal beer in my bonnet that i want to see yeah biophilic design in every NHS before I die. So <laughs> I've got to crack on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um anyway, 
Um, we'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, so obviously in the first podcast, I asked you at the end, sort of the fantasy question about um, what you, what your sort of personal, um, you know, view of like, how, if you could paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia. But so I'm going to ask you, and which is a beautiful answer, actually. So again, people are listening, check out the last podcast because, and listen right to the end because you'll you'll hear Patty um, express what how she would fit, she would paint the world with this magic brush of biophilia. Um, so how would you think a designer of an Asclepian would paint the world with his magic brush or her magic brush of uh, of biophilia? I think the way they would do it, they would look for the site first and just look around the surrounding area. I really do. And even though I said I, I was joking as an undergraduate with the Roman forts, I think there's something there, but <laughs> I'm sure people argue against that. But but I think uh, for the Asclepia, they probably looked at the surrounding. Probably, I, I really think, but I can't prove this in any way, but I really think they would just get a sense for the place. Mm -hmm. um, they would, you know, notice the views, notice the, the sounds, you know, just the whole experience of being there, the whole sensory experience. And then from there, consider how they're going to structure things and, and you know, put their buildings in. In ancient Greece, and the temples, with one exception, all face east, um, you know, so they would probably have to align it to that. Um, but not in the Roman world, you can just align temples any way you like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, are the temples actually, what are the views from the temples? Um, you know, if you're putting up structures, uh, if you're putting up rooms and spaces for people to stay in while they're ill, what, where are they going to situate? What do they see? How quiet is it? Um, so I think they would really just look at the landscape first and then start thinking about how they're going to position the buildings inside. And you know, so, so that you could take advantage of the views of, the, you know, the, the quiet of, of the fresh air and yeah so the sun and <laughs> so i think that's how they did it but I, i'd like to believe that's how they did it thank you for listening to the journal of biophilic design podcast